I turned 18 in 2008, and on the day of my birthday, for reasons I won't bore you with, I packed up my things and moved out. For four years, I lived in my car, working as a barista from 6 to 2 and as a line cook from 4 to 10. My plan was to work until I had enough money for my own place, and then to either go to college or get a real job. Looking back on it now, I don't know how I did it, but by 22 I'd saved up a decent sum of money and began my hunt for a semi-permanent place of residence. I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and though housing prices weren't as bad as they are now, it was still a pricey county. After months of asking around, I was connected with Anders, an elderly man who was leasing a two-bedroom, one-bathroom house in North Hollywood for far below market rate. The catch, because there's always a catch when it comes to affordable housing, was that the house had been terribly maintained. It had been unoccupied for a year and would need some serious TLC before most people could comfortably reside in it. I, however, had been living out of a car for four years, as long as the place had running water, it would be an upgrade for me. I moved into the house in fall 2012. Anders gave me a tour before I got settled. He was a short, joyful old man, well-meaning but, how do I put this, maybe not the most focused as a result of his age. At one point during the tour, he showed me the bathroom, then the master bedroom, then the bathroom again, then the master bedroom again. He was about to walk into the bathroom for a third time before I gently guided him down the hall. The house itself was livable but weathered. Dim lighting from outdated fixtures cast long shadows over peeling wallpaper. The ceiling in many of the rooms was discolored from past leaks, the faucet in the kitchen sink was broken, the bathtub was badly chipped, and a few of the cabinet handles fell off in my hand. It was a rundown place, located in a bars-on-the-window kind of neighborhood, but still, it was my place. I was smiling ear to ear when Anders gave me the keys. It's a good house with good bones. You take care of it, now, he instructed, which I found ironic. Before he left, he paused in the front doorway, drawing a hand to his chin as he looked behind me into the house. I tried to follow his gaze, but couldn't figure out what he was looking at. Everything all right? Yes. Just that something looks different about that bathroom, though I can't put my finger on what. Oh well, it's a good house with good bones. You take care of it, now. And with that, he gave me a nod and left me to my unpacking. I hadn't realized how much I'd missed living in a house. I didn't care how run down the place was, just having an accessible bathroom and a full-size mattress to sleep on made me feel like a king. After I'd spent a few days cleaning the place up, I invited my sister and her fiancé over for dinner. I'm sure it sounds stupid, but my newly acquired ability to host company made me proud. In no time at all, I'd comfortably settled into my new home. That evening, after saying goodbye to my guests, I took a shower. The bathroom lacked a traditional, above-the-sink mirror, instead, it had a wide, full-length mirror mounted on the wall to the left of the vanity. When I exited the shower and stepped up to the glass, raising a hand to wipe away the fog, I noticed something odd. In the condensation, right at my eye level, was the word high. I didn't know what to make of it. Somehow, the letters seemed intentional. It was hard to pass off as simply the way the steam had settled. My sister had been in the bathroom just before she left. Maybe she had written the word on the mirror with her fingertip, and the steam had only made the letters visible after my shower. I almost texted her about it, but the message seemed ridiculous when I typed it out. Paranoid, even. I wiped the mirror down and turned in for the night, and soon I forgot about it entirely. When I next noticed writing on my mirror, I had been living at the house for a month. The second sighting occurred in much the same way as the first, I came back home after work and took a shower. When I pushed back the shower curtain, I looked at the glass, and saw, written in the condensation, the words. Staying long? Now, I could pass two letters off as a coincidence, but two words? An entire question? That was no coincidence. Someone had been in my bathroom, and recently, I had contractors in and out of my house all the time, so one of them could have written the message, but why? I got dressed and put a hand on the bathroom doorknob, about to go back into my bedroom, when it occurred to me that whoever had written the message might still be around. I slowly cracked open the door, peering down the dark hallway in one direction, then the other. I listened very carefully. 
but heard nothing. I walked around my house, which didn't take long given its size, and looked for anything out of place. All of my doors were locked, all of my windows were shut, and none of my personal items had been disturbed. If someone had broken into my house, they were long gone by the time I looked around. That second message put me on edge for days. I triple checked that my windows and doors were locked each night. I looked in every potential hiding spot, of which there were few in my little house, after I came home from work and before I went to sleep. And yet, though I was certain that my house was secure, I couldn't shake the sense that something was wrong. A month passed without incident. I had almost started to feel at home in my new lodgings again until, one Friday morning, I awoke just past 3 a.m. I couldn't immediately tell what had woken me, often, the house settled at night, creaking and groaning in ways that made it sound alive, but in that moment, the house was silent. It was only after I turned my head to the side that I realized that my bedroom door, which I was certain I had shut, was wide open. I stared down the hallway, feeling as though I were gazing into a black hole. The darkness was abyssal. I kept waiting for my eyes to adjust, waiting for them to pick out the familiar shapes of my home, but they never did. I couldn't see a thing, so why did I feel like something could see me? Like there was something in the house with me, just feet beyond the threshold to my bedroom. Watching. Waiting. Somehow, I found the courage to rise from my bed and walk toward the door. When I made it to the handle, I grabbed it and slammed the door shut. I didn't investigate further, didn't so much as stick my head out into the hall for a closer look. My bedroom door didn't have a lock, none of the doors except the bathroom did, so I dragged my bookcase in front of the door. It was a small bookcase, and an intruder could probably ram the door open anyway if they wanted to, but not before the sound alerted me. When morning came and I had to leave the house for work, I genuinely considered exiting my house through the window. I was almost late by the time I worked up the nerve myself to look around my house before I left. As always, I found nothing amiss. Suddenly, I heard a click, so tiny that I'd almost missed it entirely. I tore back the shower curtain, gripping the shampoo bottle like I was about to bludgeon an intruder to death with it. As I'd come to expect, there was no one in the room, but there was a new message on the mirror. This one was bold, the easiest to read of any of the messages I'd received so far. It was three words long. I see you. Some awful amalgam of fear, confusion, and anger made my stomach churn. Ultimately, the latter emotion rose above the rest. I hastily dried off and threw on some clothes, then grabbed my phone from where I'd left it on the bathroom counter. I punched an Anders number and glared at that damn mirror as I listened to the phone ring again and again. I'd started to think it was too late for him to be awake when he suddenly picked up. He started to ask me how I was faring in my new lodgings before I cut him off. I need you to tell me if there's some way that a person could be getting into the house. I said. Every night, I check every window and door, I check every cupboard, closet, and cabinet, and still things are amiss. You need to let me know if there's some entry point that I'm not aware of. Anders didn't seem to entirely understand what I was asking. What? What's getting in? You let me know if you're having rat troubles. My last tenant before you had rat trouble sometimes. Yeah, sure, I've got rats. Besides the doors and the windows, how could they be giving in? Well, there's the fence of course, and there was a chimney once, though we had it sealed up a good long while ago. And there's also the crawl space, of course, though I'm sure you've already poked around down there. Though I knew the home had a crawl space, I'd never had much reason to investigate it. I was never able to find the entrance, even after ripping up all the carpeting in the house. Likely, hardwood had been installed over the access door, making it an unlikely point of entry for an intruder. How do I get down to the crawl space? Yes, you should give the crawl space a gander. I barely stopped myself from smashing the phone into the counter. I plan to. Where can I find the entrance? That'll be on the floor of the bathroom closet. I looked around the room. Surely, I'd misheard him. Either that or he was confused again. What? I know, it's an odd place for it, but it's only there because that room didn't always used to be a bathroom. The bathroom doesn't have a closet. Sure it does. 
just to the left of the vanity. I looked at the mirror. At that long, oversized mirror. I'd always found it odd for a bathroom of that size to have a built-in floor-to-ceiling mirror. What was it that Anders had said when he'd first visited? That something had looked different about the bathroom? Setting my phone down next to the sink, I stepped up close to the glass. I spent a few moments feeling around the frame, looking for a latch, then I grabbed a portion of the right side of the frame in two hands. After one hard yank, the mirror swung open like a door, revealing a large walk-in closet. Anders was saying something on the other end of the line, but I was too stunned to answer. There was a square-shaped hole at the back of the closet, which I assumed led down to the crawl space beneath the house. The closet floor was littered with all kinds of trash, filthy sheets, fast food containers, beer cans, and, I realized, some of my own items. Little things I thought I'd misplaced, a sock, a toothbrush, a comb, and a small, framed photograph of me, my sister, and our old family dog. I crouched down to pick up the photo, perched in the doorway as I studied my younger, smiling self. I heard Anders saying my name over the phone. Except, the voice didn't sound much like Anders at all. It was too deep. Too clear. Too close. When I looked up, a man was peeking out at me from the hole in the floor. He smiled at me, his eyes white and pupils blown, his smile so white it looked painful and his hair long and matted. He was only visible from the neck up, and the harsh lighting made it look like a disembodied head was grinning at me from the back of the closet. Horrified, I rose to my feet and ran. I didn't stop running until I made it to my car, which I promptly drove to my sister's house. The next day, I drove to the police station to file a report. An officer met me at the house to check the scene, and I showed him the hidden closet, which indeed had an entrance to the crawl space. My best guess was that the intruder was entering my crawl space from the small door on the side of my house. He'd likely been squatting in the house during the year in which it sat unoccupied, and when he saw it was being prepared for sale, he had disguised the closet door so as to keep a little room for himself. Why he decided to stay or why he was leaving me messages, I can't say. From his actions, and from what little I saw of him, I think it's safe to assume that he wasn't of sound mind. Unfortunately, the man was never found. For all I know, he's still in that same neighborhood. Hell, he might even be in the same house. I moved across the county afterwards and have lived in studio apartments ever since. The thought of living in a big house with all those rooms and corners and places to hide gives me the creeps. It's not just houses that the incident soured for me, but mirrors as well. These days, when I visit a friend or stay at a hotel, I always have to carefully inspect the bathroom mirrors, shining a light directly into their faces and tapping a finger against the glass. Because the worst detail of the whole ordeal was that, when revisiting the bathroom with a police officer, I stepped into the old closet, closed the door, and looked into the mirror. Instead of the mirror backing, I saw the officer's face on the other side of the glass. 